I call this meeting to order of the RMLB Board of Commissioners. Uh, the meeting of the RMLB Board of Commissioners is being videotaped at the RMLD office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Mass. This meeting is being videotaped for distribution to community television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Liverpool. Uh, just to read the uh, code of conduct, the RMLD Board of Commissioners reconciles, recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions and comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Upon recognize, recon, being recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public uh, comments or ensuing discussions. So with that, uh, that's kind of the opening remarks, introductions. Um, we have a citizen advisory board visitor. Do you want any, any comments, anything to say? Yeah, no, thank you for having me here. I'd like to, you know, follow the commissioner's meeting. Uh, we had our, we didn't have a meeting yesterday, and I think the last meeting we had was on November 15th, and the only two two things that were discussed, if I'm reading from the agenda here, Go ahead. Yep. Uh, we had the audited financial statements, and we reviewed the cab policies, so those were the things. Okay. So, so there's nothing right. else to... Okay, he's at the other, Dave, having trouble hearing the other end. Okay. Um, hi, hi, David. My name is Vivek Soni. I'm the new member on the cab. I represent Linfield. Okay. Okay. All right. And first, there's nothing special to report. Okay. <laughs> but your first time here, so we welcome you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll try to speak up, Dave. We'll try to speak up. I like hey, it better when we have it in the middle. Closer. Put it on a chair. You can maybe you can put it on a chair. Yeah, put them on put a, chair a chair right here in front of us. Right. Can put it on a chair in yeah, front of us here. I mean, that would work. We're just moving you, Dave. Okay. You're being moved, Dave. Great, thank you. We're trying to get you more central in the in the room here. Can you hear us now, Dave? Dave, can you hear us now? Hello. Yeah, that sounds a little better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we have a request for, I am, uh, for somebody to speak to us on a public comment. Mary Ellen O'Neill, if you want to come on up okay. to the microphone, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you. Know the feeling well, Mary Helen. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mar uh, Mary Ellen O'Neill from Reading. Um, I want to expand a little bit on the comments I made at your last meeting about trees, and I did a little bit of research on. Uh, I'll just read this so people that might be listening and don't have this can hear it. Ele electric utility tree stewardship programs, and there's a, these are three models. Uh, one is Waverly Utilities out in Iowa. It's a municipal utility that donates $10,000 each year to Trees Forever, an Iowa nonprofit organization that plants and cares for trees, prairies, and other natural resources in Iowa. Um, Avista, which seems to be a lot, very large IOU out in Washington State, is designated a tree line U.S. utility by the National Arbor Day Foundation, and that has five standards, including tree care and tree planting. Um, that are set by the Arbor Day Foundation, and there are many utilities, municipal, and IOUs throughout the country that are, are part of that program. And the third one is PPL Electric Utilities down in Pennsylvania. They have a community roots program. It purchases trees and then provides these trees on a first-come, first-served basis to city and local government groups, environmental groups, and fourth graders and uh, their um, donations for 2018 have already been capped due to um, heavy demand. It's not the first year they've done it, but okay. I guess demand is, has been increasing each year. 
So I just wanted to plant the seed and, and ask that the board consider um, perhaps developing a tree stewardship program, not based on any of these three models, but something that would work in our area where we have um, in, in, in Reading particularly a strong tree department with a tree warden and things like that that may have suggestions for where things are planted. And I'd like to go so far as asking that you consider a $10,000 beginning, you know, on a yearly basis. I was thinking that, you know, a good tree is probably three to $500 each. So if you had $2,500 per community, that's five to eight trees um, per year, potentially. So I just wanted to mention these things to you and ask that as you prepare your budget for next, for uh, fiscal year 19, that okay. you think about doing something like this as we cut further into our, our trees, uh, tree covers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks very good. For listening. Okay. Very good. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, basically, what Mary Ellen has asked, the, the, uh, that we do similar program to what's being done out in Waverly, Iowa, that uh, we consider uh, donating uh, the amount of $10,000 to the four towns, divided equally, if I have that correctly, um, as part of the program to, to, for the planting and care of trees. Okay, thanks, Bill. I didn't give you the amount. Um, okay. Can you, can you answer one question for me, Mary Ellen? What does it mean to be a tree line USA utility? What, is, what does that mean, hmm? to be designated that? It's um, the National Arbor Day Foundation uh, has, as it has a number of different programs, and this is one of theirs where they work with electric utilities throughout the country, and they have five standards. One includes, um, tree care, tree planting, um, acknowledgement of Arbor Day activities, and I forget the other two, but they have, they have a whole list on the National Arbor Day Foundation website of all okay. the participating all right. utilities. Uh, the, one, the only one in Massachusetts that's listed is Eversource, um, but there are many, particularly out in the Midwest and the South, it seems, not okay. so many in New England, but. All right. Yeah. Go check, we'll go check out the website. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the research. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, just before we <coughs> continue, I hope everybody saw the, the Chronicle this week. <laughs> so we see the uh, picture of the uh, award of the million dollar grant for energy storage, and I'm sure the general manager is going to cover that under her, under her report, <laughs> I assume. And so we will... Um, We'll leave that for, I'll leave that for, leave that, we won't steal the thunder from her. <laughs> okay. Uh, next thing I have is the, uh, the GM Managers Committee. Um, first off, let me explain to everybody that uh, because Dave is on the phone, that every vote we take tonight will be a roll call. Will be a roll call vote tonight because Dave is on the phone. Okay. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so the uh, General Managers Committee met um, since our last meeting. Uh, to review the general manager. Uh, the reviews were uh, very positive at this point. Uh, we basically scored things on different categories. We get weighted things um, in the category, and you know, we, the top category was 100%. Uh, the bottom was obviously zero, but um, the, the overall score was 99.2% in terms of the ratings that we, that we came up with between the five commissioners. Uh, and the evaluations are uh, kept by the department here now. Uh, and basically that, that meant that we rec what we were recommending to the commission uh, from the subcommittee is that we have a 4.5% increase for the general manager's salary with an additional $5,000 bonus that I believe she has the, that we gave her the discretion whether she wants to put that as additional ICMA con or, or on-term compensation. So that's, uh, that's what the recommendation we came up with. So. I do need somebody to make a motion for the commission to rec to uh, to a vote on that, if you would, please. <clears throat> yes, so move to um, follow the recommendation of the uh, uh, general manager committee. Okay. Uh, as as stated. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any, you either want to add anything? I just want to say, sure. uh, you know, publicly that uh, 
As I speak, I think for all the board members, we're very glad to have Colleen as our general manager. I think mm -hmm. the scores reflect the board satisfaction, but in addition to that, uh, you know, the, the $1 million uh, grant is just one of many examples that her yep. and her very capable staff have yep. done to make Reading a very uh, a productive and uh, right. a, a leader in the utility business. So yep. thank you, Colleen. And You're welcome. Look forward My to pleasure. Working with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to add that, it's, you know, I, I'm very impressed with Colleen's leadership here in the department. I see two people that are sitting out here both Hamid and Jane, that I see much different from the time before she got here. Much improved. <laughs> so I you think that's the... remember she was toddlers, I would guess. <laughs> 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 30, 31. Oh, 30 31. 31. <laughs> Let's get it right. <laughs> okay. So I've been moving to second. Dave, you, you want to add anything? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, and I certainly couldn't do it by myself. So I'm I'm very appreciative yeah. of of the leadership. Right. You mentioned in your memo that uh, you know you did something for extra for Hamid, and at least Sarah would thank you for me as well, and everybody else. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded. <coughs> Take a vote. Yep. All those in favor, please say aye. Mr. O Mr. O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, aye. Ms. Pacino, aye. Mr. John Stempeck, aye. Mr. Talbot. Mr. Talbot, aye. Okay, very good. All right, great. So that, that is so, approved. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, so uh, is it clear that that's not retroactive to her fiscal start date? Right, Re retroactive to the fiscal start. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. okay. All right, the next item I've got is the uh, subsequent town meeting. Uh, so Colleen got up and we made a presentation at the subsequent town meeting. Uh, presentation went very well. Um, those of you who were in attendance that night can attest to that. Um, so I don't know if there's any much anything to add. If you want to add anything to this presentation you made, yeah, Mr. Chair, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you may want to. I don't have anything to add, but for the uh, listening audience, uh, maybe they just need a sound bite on what the subsequent town meeting was. You know what the subject matter was. Okay. Regarding you want to you want to address that? Right. Each year uh, during the town meeting, the RMLD has the opportunity to uh, go over the previous fiscal year's um, highlights, including uh, the outcome of the audit, which was clean and without a management letter, all the successes that we had within that fiscal year, and also an opportunity to uh, go over some of the um, strategic visions that we have uh, in our five-year plan out to our 20-year plan. Um, this year we were uh, very proud to have introduced a, a high school art program um, and as everyone knows we we went paperless on our annual report several years ago and started using some um, teenage artwork uh, to sh uh, shave our peak and then shred our peak, be efficient, get greener, um, go paperless. And then this past year, the high school that came in and did the art, we, we selected a f uh, first, second, third, and fourth, and the first place winner uh, donned the cover of our FY17 annual report, which was, um, I, I mean, the artwork was just beautiful. The kids really enjoyed themselves. Uh, and it was, it's a significant savings to produce that annual report in-house. And I think it, frankly, it has a better quality than it was when it was being done professionally. And, I, and I'm very proud and honored to work with uh, the employees that helped put that together. And, and, um, and I think the public appreciated it as well. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, there was no Citizen Advisory Board meeting, so there is no... Nothing to report on that. Mr. Chair? Yep. Comment. So uh, I wanted to make a suggestion, uh, I think because of obviously people's schedules, uh, maybe we could, you know, as a hopefully help, help for Tracy, maybe we could consider uh, sometime between now and the next meeting putting a draft schedule for the year, you know, the calendar year. That way, if someone can't make it, they can swap off with another. Because I think lately it's just everybody's been <laughs> 
jammed, and I think okay. we have the dates in the calendar. Similar to what we do at the payroll. Okay. And Warren signing the checks right. out. <coughs> yeah. out. Okay. Good I know that would be. The CA, attendance of the CAB meeting. It's good thought. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. Ready to move on. So the next one we have is the board minutes. So I need a motion to approve the minutes of June 15, 2017, which which the, which the secretary finally got around to reviewing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Do I have a motion? Um, I move that we uh, the board approves the minutes of the November 15, 2017. June, June 15. Oh, June 15. Excuse me, June, June 15. 15th. The September 14th of 2017 is not ready yet, so. The June 15th minutes that we're approving. All right, second the motion. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Or none. All those in favor? Mr. Rock. Tom Rock, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. John Stempeck, aye. Mr. Talbot? Talbot, aye. Okay, very good. Aye. We're on to the GM report. <coughs> we'll pass the picture over. We can let her look at it. <laughs> we can put it up in front of her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. This is me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Charlie Baker, Hamid, Jane, and the Commissioner Judith Judson, and Tom O'Lilla, who helped to put together the, um, the grant with NextTerra Energy. So we're really excited to have um, received this award uh, and especially to be able to add something to our, our peak reduction portfolio uh, that is now renewable. It's exciting to be part of that technology. Uh, so we'll be working with NextTerra Energy to build this. Uh, we're expecting it to be built before the peak of next year. Uh, it's a five megawatt uh, battery storage unit, um, uh, lithon ion batteries. And um, it discharges over two hours. So that'll make an impact on, on um, saving some overall cost to the transmission and capacity with the intent of you know continuing to stabilize our rate is wow, right amazing. yeah i figured you would be happy dave <laughs> so uh there was actually si th there was si sure go ahead, go ahead dave yes that's correct so anyways, it was the Baker Polito uh, Administration um, Energy Storage Initiative. Uh, it was originally a $10 million grant uh, that was going to be given out to various recipients. They ended up with 69 uh, proposals, um, grant proposals, 20, I believe 29 uh, recipients, and they increased it to $20 million, and uh, Reading was um, honored to receive the $1 million. And so when NextTerra builds this, we're actually using the million dollars split over three years to reduce the, the power supply cost from that. So that'll be passed on to all of our customers. So the project will be um, worked on with uh, between engineering and operations and Jane Parento's group, the integrated resources. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Along yeah. with our community solar, we're uh, really doing a good job as far as um, Treading the peak and yeah. getting green, going renewable, saving the planet. We're doing all of that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's not even Christmas. Not even Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you doing the uh, quarterly updates? You're doing, or is that him? Eat? Okay. Me. All right. Come on up. Mm -hmm. Sure, go ahead. May I? Go ahead. Um, yep. So Jane is here, and she's going to be giving her presentation, and I think she'll provide that information. It's about 13 percent, um, but when she gets up, you can you can ask her um, some more <coughs> questions as far as clean energy, renewable energy. I mean, there's a whole plethora of what green means. Um, you yep. know, carbon-free, 
So she can go through some of those questions if you want, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, it would be great to, um, through the presentation, that all of you will see it. If you can send it after the meeting, that would be great. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Amit, you're up. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, glad to provide you the uh, report for the uh, for the recommendations that uh, uh, were made by the consultants, basically by both our associates as well as the UPG when we did the, the testing of uh, all the substation equipment. <coughs> Uh, over three years ago, just for the benefit of the uh, new cab member, Mr. Sony, uh, we uh, created baseline basically by bringing a contractor UPG to test all the substations. We found some problems and some issues that they were uh, addressed uh, basically on the report, as well as the booth study, planning study we did in 2015 that identified some areas that need improvements. And this list is the result of those recommendations, basically, that uh, as good business practices. So as you could see that, you know, we've made lots of progress on those. Uh, uh, and uh, if you go to page two, you see item number 29 and item number 35. They were both uh, recommendations that were made by Booth and Associates, the consultant who did the planning study. <clears throat> and item number 29 is about the station three. In the station three, just to give you background, we had uh, lots and lots of problems, the design issues that they were not really addressed originally when the substation was designed. Uh, there were some control wiring issues, the relays were really outdated relays, we could only bring back limited information to this data which for operational purposes it was, you know, it was not really uh, the uh, ideal situation. <clears throat> also, uh, the automatic bus transfer scheme between bus A and bus B wasn't working properly uh, from the get-go. Uh, there also are some other problems that we are addressing, and that was the, that's the high fault current, which is going to lead into high incident energy uh, when they're operating the breakers in the, inside the substation. And the reason is because the wrong transformers were designed, actually, or set, set up mm -hmm. for this. <clears throat> so in order to address the fault issues, in fall we have a project that uh, it's going to actually in spring, we're going to install these reactors that it's going to drop the incident energy to acceptable level. So we don't have to, you know, we worry about arc flash. Uh, however, still the other issues that were picked up during this uh, actually uh, um, uh, the system analysis and also the testing, the bus transfer scheme and also the control wirings that we had issues with, they're all fixed and they're all addressed. So it took us a while to do that, but now, you know, if something happens to one transformer, automatically the load is going to be transferred within uh, 10 seconds, less than 10 seconds, to the other transformer. Mm -hmm. Before we didn't have that capability, it was not going to be the situation. Somebody need to go to the substation and manually do that auto transfer. So now that automation is taken care of <clears throat> and it's working now. So that's for uh, item number 29 item and also item numbers uh, 51, 53 through 56 on page 3. So these are all related to the issues that we had at uh, substation 3. Item number 35, it's a substation automation, which we, I'm glad to announce that, you know, we've done all the uh, automations that needed to be done, ready for a smart grid, uh, as well as the issues that we had at the station four, that all the relays, you know, they're replaced. We had a problem that only one phase was brought into the SCADA, and uh, we couldn't bring the information about the other two phases, so we didn't know what uh, they were running at. And now we changed all the relays to the new generation of the Schweitzer relays, which we can bring more information back for operational purposes and for analysis and also <coughs> monitoring their feeders' performance. These are all done, taking care of the substations that basically are in good shape for now. Great. Any questions? Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so what, uh, I'm trying to remember, what was the time frame for the uh, 
Yeah, obviously, there's more than one here, but what's, what's the window of time the, that the we planning targeted? study was done, uh, was a 20-year planning study. Yeah. But most of these immediate actions that they needed to be taken care of, it was like about between uh, one to five years. Yeah. You know, it's you know, a well, <coughs> two-car, let me just roughly, it looks like well, certainly over 50% complete. Right. Great, and there's another. It is. It's almost 30% in progress, and I, I assume that the in the alternate solutions, those are ones that are getting resolved, but not through the necessary the re recommendation of the... Exactly. Part of, part of the problem to that being that, you know, they, they asked us to actually, they studied said to parallel some of the feeders coming out of the substations. There is no duct bank really to do that, and we can't fit all those cables in one uh, duct. So uh, uh, the alternate solution to that would be building a new substation in Wilmington. When we do that, we're going to transfer some of the load from Station 4, from Station three and pick up almost all the loads from station five. And when we do that with that, that's gonna solve that problem. Right. So rather than spending money and replacing the cables with the bigger cable, which is not going to work paralleling, which we can't do. So we figured we're gonna wait until we build a new substation and reanalyze the performance of the feeders. And then if we need to make any improvements, we do that. That's why they don't yeah, no, I mean, over, overall, I mean, like 90-something percent of it's right. actioned in one way. But uh, the process I want to compliment the team on because, uh, you know, John knows from his consulting experience, you know, a lot of times these reports end right. up in the drawer, you right. know, with mm. some, some right. action, but not a lot. But, I mean, we've uh, you've developed it. Right. you know, managed it and report on it regularly, which is the keys to success, so right. I think that's great. Right, thank you. We prioritized the ones that they needed to be immediate yep. from the safety stand, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? That's and excellent. that's what we've done, and now we're basically down to the other stuff that, you know, could possibly wait, and it's not the immediate concern, right. mm -hmm. but, you know, we have plans for them. <coughs> Good, thank excellent. You. Thank you. Yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. So wh where is the substation three? The st substation three is North Reading. It's substation in North four Reading. is in Reading, okay. and substation five is in uh, Wilmington. Okay. And when was that originally set up? Uh, the setup on uh, station three was done over twelve years ago. Twelve years ago. It's fairly new substation. Station four is like about uh, twenty years, and station five it's uh, more than that, twenty-five, thirty years. Station five is pretty much at the end of its useful yeah. life. So that's why we are looking to install a new, uh, construct a new substation okay. in Wilmington to retire that substation. But actually, we're not going to retire. When we build a new substation, that substation is still going to be in place. Mm, we're going to use whatever the remaining life is left. And then after that, you know, we get rid of the equipment and mm -hmm. probably use it as a switching station. Okay. That's what the plan is. Okay. Any Thank other questions? All right. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thanks, Amin. Thank you. Okay. So we've got the organizational study now. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I apologize because when you print this out, you can't tell really the difference between the hash marked and the solid. So um, I think it's the way the the printer printed it, but. Um, I think the next time we give the update on next quarter, I'm going to change up the colors and, and actually uh, some of these like established planning culture that's ongoing, um, I, I think we maybe we'll write them a little bit differently. Um, but to just go through some of the um, areas, the main areas that we've been working on and, and have made some great headway um, in Jane's group in the Integrated Resources uh, Division. She's working on her uh, strategic vision and roadmap for her entire group, which consists of both retail and wholesale. Um, and she's working on putting that plan together in a visual so that you can see it out over five years to 20 years. But even while she constructs that schedule, uh, we've already started on some of the roadmap milestones that we've already identified that will be on there. That would include the cost of service study we just did and then the rate adjustments we did to bring the subsidations back uh, in line with um, best rate utility practices. Um, 
the um, renewable portfolios that we're working on, uh, the rebate restructuring and the customer portal for rebates online, um, the risk mitigation uh, on the purchase supply purchases that we just had that presentation from Nextera and Jane in, uh, a couple weeks ago. So there's a lot of milestones that we've hit already. Uh, I think it's just a matter of probably another, I put it into um, first quarter of next year uh, to actually get a visual uh, laid out for that roadmap. Uh, that's actually number 1.3. Uh, if we go down to 2.1 to 2.3, the succession planning, job descriptions, workforce development, um, those continue to happen. We are at a granular level, the next phase of our reorganization, which means we looked at it at a higher level to see what we needed. There was a lot of changes made, and now we are assessing each group individually. Um, you know, each of the job description, each of the organizational charts that are revised, the job description are rewritten, those have to go through the union. There's a, there's a significant process that happens when you're reorganizing individual groups. Um, right now, we're just finishing up with IT, and then we're going into tech services. We just started that yesterday. Uh, so those are moving along, um, and we're hoping to have that wrapped up um, first quarter next year. And that way, uh, just about all of the succession plans, job descriptions, uh, the organizational charts, it should all be completed. That takes us to 2.6 with filling vacant positions. So as we develop these org charts, uh, and, and some things shake out, uh, you know, we post the jobs and, and we're going as quickly as we can to try to fill them. Uh, that brings us down to 3.4, where we had reorganized and expanded the engineering group and we just recently hired two engineers. So uh, we're very happy with that. Um, they, they are not at a system engineering level, but they're, uh, they have solid foundations, and, and Hamid's been working with them and training them, and, and we feel like they're going to be very successful in a short amount of time. Great. Um, Wendy is still working on formalizing our business profit. I just I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. Colleen, what's the, uh, I know it obviously varies by the experience level you're hiring, but on average, what's the uh, time it takes for the person to get you know, fully onboarded and you know, productive when you hire a new engineer? After they're hired or trying to hire them? No, once you hire them, so once you oh, bring them in, you because trying to hire them is, is very difficult because yeah. of uh, the lack of, yeah, you know, electrical so power engineers in this yeah, area. Yeah, so what, what's the cycle time for hire? <coughs> Three months or four months? Um, it can be significantly longer. It's, yeah. it, it depends on whether, um, I don't know, it's luck. <laughs> uh, we, Hamid and I have a lot of networks and, um, there just is not a significant amount of utility engineers in this area. So a lot of utilities will hire electrical engineers and grow them. Yeah. But unfortunately, because we didn't have succession planning here previously, uh, it would, you wouldn't be able to run a utility with all green people. So we are trying to have the right level of skill sets. You know, green is good. Yeah. yeah. What? You know, green well, is green's good. good. Unless it's, <laughs> unless, unless it's people. people. <laughs> <laughs> what about internships? Um, so, <coughs> well, you, you know, you have to manage interns. So what we're trying to do is tr we're trying to establish the workforce uh, first, and then then we'll be able yeah, to bring in people. Because sure right now we're training an awful lot of employees, right. um, and and so yeah, we have co-ops and interns are. We would like to be able to bring them in, but I think we have to establish what we've we've already got. Uh, so to answer your question, once an engineer is hired in uh, electrical, it, you have an electrical engineer, distribution engineer, senior distribution engineer, and system engineer. And your proficiencies at senior distribution, um, I mean system engineer, means you can be in charge of the entire system, the switching, uh, the whole control room. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of responsibility. Um, the, it, if you came right out of college and we took you and trained you and you went through our career development program, it would take between five to seven years for you to become a system engineer. So even if we get an engineer that maybe has five years of experience, if it's not in the utility industry, it's still going to take them probably about five years in order to become a system engineer for a utility for distribution. We also have transmission here too as well. Yeah. And we like uh, to train our engineers so that it's soup to nuts. 
you know, we, we do everything here. They know how to do it all. Yeah. So if we're hiring a consultant, it's because we just don't physically have enough arms and legs to do it, not because we don't have the talent. Yeah. So the training is, is pretty thorough, thanks to Hamid. Yeah, that's so. a good development plan, too. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay, correct. great. Thank you. Vivek? Yeah, I, I had a question on 2.6. 2.6. Uh, you, uh, you said you had vacant positions. I just know, I want to know how many vacant positions do you have right now? Um, we have several vacant positions, but as you're reorganizing, you may have a vacant position over here, but if the reorganization says that that body or that vacancy is better utilized over here, it may switch and we, use, we have to evaluate that. So right now uh, we have, we still have a vacant engineering position. Um, one. We have one vacant engineering position left in electrical. I mean, I could go through each of the divisions, but again, I, I would rather not say it publicly because we're still in the reorganizational phase. And if I say it and then, I, and then we switch it before we finish our org chart, it, it may be a little awkward. But I would say there's, a, there's about five to six vacancies. Where exactly they're going to land, we're working on that. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Because I, I thought the last time when we had met, you had said that you were concerned about engineering positions. So good, you got at least two out of those three filled, right? Yeah, we just actually hired someone who came on the day of the storm. <laughs> that was his first day, and he hit he the ground well running. Day. He stayed the whole. He's still here, <laughs> and uh, and he did a great job. He was Good. really helpful Good. right on storm day. So, great. we're very fortunate. Okay. Very good. Is that okay? okay. Yep. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on, let's see, uh, three point six on the communications plan. So Hamid has gone over his technology roadmap. So while we have a commu communications roadmap that actually Priscilla had worked on before she left and Joyce has been tweaking, Hamid's outage management system and how we communicate to the public is going to be impacted and changing for the better. And so you'll see some revisions to that coming up. Um, Cross-divisional management training is ongoing. If we go to the next page. Um, a lot of the training comes under the employee's career developments. That's why I said I, I might revise this up a little bit. The risk management committee and enterprise risk management, um, that was the next Terra uh, presentation. That was on power supply. There are other risk mitigation efforts in each of the groups that will be part of their vision uh, strategic plans. Uh, Wendy is still working on formalizing the financial and accounting business processes. She's in progress with that. Um, that, so that should have been extended. Going down to 10.1, assigning a compliance manager. Um, we just want to get all of our ducks in a row before we have someone come in auditing us because that would be premature. So we're holding up on that. Uh, on the next page, asset management plan. Um, we have a spry point system in that's an interim work order system, but Wendy over the next year is going to be putting together a committee for a real work order system that we'll be looking at that will uh, address uh, formally the asset management plan. Uh, and that takes care of 13.2 as well and 13.3. Uh, 14.4, we collected all of our GIS and we've trained all of our engineers. Uh, we're <coughs> currently putting the GIS uh, standardized nomenclature on the mapping and then we'll be able to get it out to the tablets so that the engineers and the operations can use it in the field. Uh, the uh, <coughs> work management business process goes back up under the asset management that we already discussed. The enhance the current workplace, uh, again, for probably the next meeting, I'd like that we, we take a tour of it so I can show you all of the changes uh, and the efficiencies of, of the uh, physical reorganization of the, of the building and where people work and, and how communication has been changed and enhanced. So that's enhancing the current workplace, and that's my update. Okay. Yes. Yeah, actually, Wendy, I'd make it more for you. Do we, I uh, can't remember from the financials, do we measure, uh, do we have a return on asset metric? I can't remember. Or should we, I, I'm not sure if it really would apply. You know, something that would measure uh, 
if we get the, the right. John, help me out. Do you remember this? Return on assets. Yeah, we had looked yeah. at. I think we had done a just an initial comparison against some of the larger mm -hmm. uh, systems that were out there, and yeah. I think we found that we're equal to or better than uh, yeah. than other systems. But that was sort of a back of the envelope yeah, what kind of calculation. I, right. I guess what I was thinking too is just something that measures the efficiency of your your assets. You know, it's a sort of return on. On your investment, so I don't know. No, I, may don't not think, I don't think we have anything in place for okay. Me, but, okay. Uh, we'll okay. 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 Good. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. I'm going to have to get off the call. I'm having a little bit of trouble here anyway. So thank you very much, Toby, for the report. And congrats on the battery grant. I'm sorry that I won't be able to hear Dave. I can't see it anyway, Dave, because it's taking off renewables. Um, but if you could send that to me, I'd be grateful. And I think it's that the Community meetings are going to be some discussions about what people wanted to change in the evaluation form, so maybe we could put that for January, um, as well as you know, the question about what the board wants to be updated about. Um, okay. Maybe that could be something we can set up in January, too. Okay. Just an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. I guess that, uh, that would also apply any strategic things that we, we want to have prioritized. Maybe that. Yeah, yeah, Dave, just a call. I think on the review form, I think the last, as I recall, the last recommendation there was that the commissioners were going to send Tracy uh, inputs and then you right. were, I think you right. were going to kind of consolidate it, Tracy, or something. Is that my remembering? Okay. That? So something. And not, not that we couldn't discuss it at a meeting, but just to, to, to you know, prevent a lot of back and forth. Yeah. But the other, uh, uh, you know, what the board's looking for, that would be a good discussion, I think. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. I find it hard to send emails in and if we did it at a meeting, it would be streamlined a bit when we're all in the same room. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. I, I, I had I one. Same idea. Have people Go ahead. No, please let him finish. Okay. 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 Very good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks Dave. Dave. Okay. okay. Thanks. So uh, I, I had a question about. Uh, no, no, we have a question. Right. The, the CAB member has a question. So this is this is a good organizational study and this analysis of risk and the uh, CAB member is asking a question, Dave. Okay, so so my question is around uh, nowadays. I think there's a lot of interest or, or there's a lot of concern about cybersecurity, and I, I know. Uh, so just wanted to understand as you're planning here, uh, how 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 do you integrate cybersecurity and reviewing cybersecurity on an ongoing basis. Right. That was a topic for discussion yeah. for, for okay. uh, one of our sessions, right. but I believe we've implemented some. We, we have to follow some very, very, very strict guidelines on cybersecurity and NERC compliance, which is your NERC compliance. Not, yes. All right. Okay. Bye, Dave. Good night, Dave. Good night, Dave. Yep. Yeah. Um, Good night. Good night. Uh, NERC compliance is actually a full-time job, so we use. Uh, Emergency broadcast system. Yes. <laughs> we actually use a. Attack in five minutes. <laughs> we actually use a consultant that a lot of the other utilities share because it is a full-time job. Okay. To keep up with the NERC compliance, um, but we are 100% in compliance. It changes every day, so new compliance measures will come in. We have to analyze them. We have to report back on them. It's an ongoing no, effort. No, no, thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. That it's, it wasn't a one-shot deal, but it's an ongoing yes, process. Yes, okay. absolutely. Plus, we, uh, what we did, we invested in the software, very secure software called End Dimensions, like a security software, which was in, uh, actually installed back in 2015, and that has three levels of security, uh, which was very basically coding and, and encoding. So especially for the scale, like what Colin mentioned, for the NERC, you have to be... Because you don't want someone to lock up your system. Because yeah. you don't want someone to lock up your system. And no system is 100% bulletproof. Right. We've got it bulletproof to the best we can for whatever is out there. Available. Right. right. We're, meeting, we're, we're in compliance. We are in compliance. But a, as things change, with technology changes and hacking changes, the, the NERC changes their compliances, <laughs> and we have to update them, and we have to stay in compliance. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. 
Good. So, so I, I just, but I may. Uh, go ahead. The, the uh, you know, this is uh, this is very impressive. It uh, appears that you know 90 percent or 80 90 percent of this is accomplished by the end of your um, calendar year 2017 and moving into most most of it being totally completed by mid-year 2018 is that correct yes that's that's the um, that's the goal there there are a couple of them like um, I mean we're, we're changing the culture to from reactive to proactive which is changing the planning culture right um, that's what I'm saying I'm hoping that something like that would be considered completing that effort um, you know, will everyone here thinking of planning m mode? Probably not. <laughs> but well, I think the level of detail, though, is very impressive. I mean, it's really laid out very well, right. very thoughtful, and to have a Gantt chart that kind of shows when it's going to be done by and if it's been done by. Uh, again, it's impressive. If you don't if you don't track something, you're out of control. Right. And so I think this is uh, it's very impressive that way. Especially in you know in human capital issues, uh, things <laughs> are le less right. easy to manage. You know, Very much so. <laughs> unlike uh, physical assets. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank ready you. to move on? Okay. Jane, you're up. Mm. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to report on a couple of community relations events. Um, we are currently sponsoring a holiday lighting decorating contest. Um, anyone who would like to submit an application would, just needs to take a picture of the outside of their house. They can go to our website, www.rmld.com. They could upload the picture, and um, they need to do that uh, by Sunday, December 17th. Um, after that period, from um, Tuesday, December 19th through Friday, December 29th, um, RMLD customers will be able to go online and vote. Um, for We'll have winners in each community. So if you live in Reading, there'll be Reading constituents or customers that you can vote for, uh, similar in Wilmington, North Reading, and Linfield. Um, as of January 3rd, we'll, we'll be posting winners from uh, one winner from each town, and those recipients will receive a $50 credit on their bill. So we encourage customers who have uh, spent the time decorating their house to take a quick picture and upload it to the, uh, the website. Um, additionally, we've completed the uh, elementary school art contest. Uh, we've received all the, uh, the drawings, and the, the, the children did a really nice job. Uh, we're uh, planning on hosting uh, two events for the award ceremonies because we have 11 participating schools. Um, and so those dates are Thursday, January 11th at 7 p.m. And um, Joyce will send this out to the commissioners um, as a reminder uh, with a snow date of uh, January 16th. Um, and the second date would be a week later on Thursday, January 18th at 7 p.m. Um, and that would have a snow date of January 23rd. Um, and then I'd like to report on the October purchase power. Uh, if we look at this first graph, what we've looked at is the fuel charge adjustment, which is the, the cost that our customers actually uh, pay us, and it shows up on the, on the bill. Uh, we looked at, uh, because we were reporting on October, we looked 11 months back. So uh, the, the bar chart uh, represents November uh, 2015 through October 16. And the line chart re uh, represents November 16th through October uh, 2017. Um, and as you can see from this chart, um, our customers have, be, have been receiving a reduction in the fuel charge. Uh, if you look over that 12-month period, uh, the, the former one, the average cost was just a little under five cents over the 12-month period, or 0.0496. Um, and then if we look at the current October and go 11 months back, um, it's dropped to 0 0.048. Uh, so that's a, a reduction of 3% that uh, our customers are directly receiving that benefit, mm. yeah. um, which, is, which, is, which is a good thing. The next graph, um, which we've been talking about, represents the purchase power capacity and transmission charge. Um, and as we've been telling all of our customers as of Ju June of 2017, uh, Reading, as well as other utilities that are in the NEMA, or the Northeast Massachusetts zone, 
have experienced significant transmission increases. Um, and that is depicted when you start looking at the, uh, the July rate going up because our fiscal year starts in July. And so when you look at that, th those two, the bar chart being the, the former uh, rate and then the blue line chart being the, the current October going back 11 months, uh, there's been about a 4.5% increase. Um, so the PPCT charge, which is a, a line item charge on customer's bill, um, uh, for this 12-month period has averaged um, a little over 5 cents or 5.1 cents compared to last year, which was at uh, 4.8 cents. And again, capacity has been the biggest driver uh, for that. Uh, the good news about that is starting in June, it's going to be going down. And, and that, again, will be reflected right in this PPCT charge rate because the RMLD doesn't make any revenue or profit on this. It's a pass through to our customers. And a lot of our programs that we have with rebates and our, our peak shaving portfolio are designed to reduce those costs. So we're, we're doing our best in terms of um, trying to mitigate those costs. And then the final graph looks at uh, for our uh, the NIPA credit, which is another line item on the bill for residential customers. Uh, this is a benefit that residential customers receive by uh, the RMLD having the NIPA contract, which is hydropower from New York. Um, it was federally legislated, uh, it's a federal law that we have to give this credit to our customers. Um, and this has actually been pretty fat, flat over the, the two year period. Um, it, it, it works out to be just under a, a half a mil. Um, in the first year, it's about 0 0.0049 cents, and then it's about 0 0.0049 uh, for the current year. So uh, that's a direct benefit that our, our, re our residential customers are receiving on a monthly basis. Um, just to answer a couple of Dave's questions in terms of uh, renewables and um, carbon free, um, when we look in the October report of the uh, power supply, uh, RMLD had 13% of um, renewable generated projects and that uh, encompasses hydro, wind and solar. Uh, RMLD has quite a few uh, renewables in their portfolio um, and we're looking to expand that. Uh, uh, we've met with the board a couple of months ago to talk about trying to get projects cited in our distribution area. Uh, we're working with three different suppliers to try to do that before the March deadline for the SREC contracts. Um, and so those are ongoing. Uh, we're looking, uh, Hamid has assigned engineers to work on system impact studies. Um, so those numbers will actually be increasing in terms of the solar within our service territory which helps uh, reduce peak demand, um, especially during the summer and uh, during portions of the um, transmission year. And so if we also look, uh, you know, we're working with customers, you know, being green can be a variety of things. Um, and so some, some customers, uh, Hingham had a, a, an article in the paper where they're going 100% I don't know if they call it renewable or carbon free, I think. Um, and so what happens is you're allowed to, co uh, to count your nuclear projects within your portfolio. Uh, the RMLD elected to sign some long-term life of unit contracts way back in uh, the early 80s, Phil, uh, with Millstone and Seabrook. Yep. And so when you look at that within our portfolio, we go from 13% to over 26.6% because we have those nuclear projects which aren't emitting um, carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so we are working diligently to look at the portfolio, to look at uh, areas that we can continue to be environmentally friendly um, and meet the sustainability objective that we have in the policy that the board has established. Any questions? Jay, do you see any? Uh I mean, I know it's probably hard to predict, but like in two years, would you see that 13% being, you know, 15 or 18 or whatever? Yeah, I do see that. Uh, as I mentioned, the solar projects are, you know, they'll add some uh, power. Uh, we have hydro developers that are coming to talk to us. Um, Colleen and I spoke to a uh, wind developer. Um, um, they, they were working for Calpine up in Maine and we're, we're exploring that project. Um, so they're, they're, they like to, to work with municipals because we're a good credit risk. Uh, 
We structure the contract so we're only paying for the energy. We structure it on a kilowatt hour basis, so we're only paying for the, for the power when it's being received. Um, so I do anticipate that that would be increasing. The grant will impact it too, right? Correct, yeah. correct. Okay, if I may, uh, Jane, uh, I seem to remember uh, uh, whatever happened to Quebec hydropower. Are they, are they still hung up in court? And uh, well, other? they're looking to do the, um, to bring a lot of hydropower into the New England region, like over 2,000 megawatts of, I forgot what it's called, um, and I apologize. Um, but they need to build the transmission <laughs> infrastructure. So they don't have the infrastructure yet. To get it down. Uh, we do have some Hydro-Quebec entitlements, uh, that, which means we've put in the capital for some of those lines, that are the existing lines that are there, um, that people can bring power in. And it's usually suppliers. Um, so what we're, we're, we're maximizing that right now by um, partnering with Energy New England and then we've, they partner with Green Mountain Power and we're receiving the benefits for that right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, yes, go ahead. I, I had a question. I heard something about a policy from the board on renewables. Mm -hmm. Is there a goal or there's an intent? I think we had a goal. We had it in our charter at one point yeah. in time it's to be about, goal. I thought it was 15% moving to maybe 17%. I'd have to go back and look, but yeah. this was years ago that we had instituted that, that I don't we, remember the exact numbers I don't yeah. remember the exact numbers yeah anymore. and I, I think one of the one of the caveats that we wanted to get cost effect or, or there was there was a stipulation within the sustainability policy that uh, it needs to be um, low risk low risk uh, and, and so that we're not going out and purchasing you know 30 or 40 cent power right. to meet a goal because we wanted to be cost conscious because that goes into the portfolio and it's reflected in the fuel charge for all our customers. So, you know, our group is working very diligently to get cost-effective projects within the portfolio. Um, we think it's important and when we think it's achievable because um, the developers are willing to work with us. Okay. Can you take that policy up and forward sure. it to him? At the I'd end? be happy yeah. to. Yeah, and I just want to know, is there any pressure from the state? Because the state has some, you know, big long-term guidelines as to what the state wants to accomplish. And I don't know if that comes through to utilities. I'll, if you want me to speak to that. Go ahead, if you would, please. We're actually um, discussing that now with the state. Um, we're deregulated. And so regulating us and taking away local control is a concern so on one hand you have the deregulation regulation issue and on the other hand you have what the state would would might like to have you know a hundred percent renewable by 2050 and so there's a lot of discussions that are going on with that and um, we meet with a lot of our um, other managers and other utilities in in our um, like the MEME and NEPA and, and associations that have to do with the municipal, locally owned utilities to discuss how we're going to approach the discussions with the state on something because you don't want to lose your local control, but at the same time, we also want to be part of, um, you know, clean energy. So it's, it's a complicated conversation, and I'd be glad to talk to you offline about it. Thank good. you. Thank you, Jay. Welcome. Welcome. Wendy, you're, you're next. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So the financials that are in front of you, <clears throat> I'm reporting on October 31st. So the first four months of the fiscal year 18. And um, if you look quickly at the uh, balance sheet, you notice that our cash is down uh, almost $4 million. But quickly looking at the um, receivables and the payables, you can tell that it's reflective of what's happening there. Our receivables are up about a million, and our payables are down about $3 million. So there's the difference right there. It's just a timing effect, once again, sure. that we um, you know, consistently discuss. 
and then our restricted cash, you notice the, the uh, large jump, and most of that is due to the $5.6 million that was added from the pension trust. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the second page just goes into the detail of um, each cash account, so the unrestricted and the restricted. And then you can see the um, difference in cash. So not only did we increase our restricted cash by the pension, uh, we're gaining interest on many of the other accounts that are um, increasing the funds there. Page three goes into uh, specifically talking about our capital funds. So I'm just giving you, uh, I think you're familiar with this uh, report, I'm giving you the balances of the depreciation fund balance at the end of uh, fiscal year 17. So basically what we're starting with is $2.4 million. And then we added $2.5 million um, to the construction fund from the operating um, funds. And then we show the interest amount being earned for the first four months and our depreciation transfer. We take our uh, $4.3 million of depreciation expense and monthly we accrue it and we transfer the money to the, um, the depreciation fund so that we can utilize those funds for um, construction. And then you have your total use of capital funds about $1.6 million through October which leaves us currently with 4.7 of um, capital funds. So then when we talk about the uh, profit and loss statement, the um, operating revenues versus our operating expenses, I just wanted to show you um, this bar chart here. I'm just comparing base revenue to operating expenses just to um, kind of see where we are. And if you look at the red, it shows FY17, four months of FY17 compared to the green, which is four months of the current FY18. And um, in FY18, $9.4 million of base revenue has decreased from 9.6 in FY17. So it's about a 2% decrease. But uh, staying consistent, we have decreased $6.3 million of expenses from six point, almost $6.5 million. So it's, it's about the same, 2% 2 2 decrease in revenues as is 2% decrease in uh, expenses, okay? The next chart just uh, gives you a little bit of a view of our operating and maintenance expenses from FY17 as compared to FY18 as compared to the budget. So as I just stated, we, we've decreased 2% and um, looking at the budget, we are also under budget in every area uh, of, well, we're, overall, we're under budget. I should say it that way, I'm sorry. Overall, we're under budget on our operating and maintenance expenses. The third chart. So I just wanted to touch on uh, base revenue and kilowatt hours sold. So I wanted to do a 12 month comparison from um, November of 16 through October of 17, as well as the previous year, 15 to 16, just to kind of go over, you know, try to look at a little bit of a trend here. And so if you look at the orange uh, bar as compared to the gray, that shows you your base revenue, and then your lines, your yellow, and your blue is your kilowatt hour sales. So when we, we look back 11 months and we compare this time frame, we notice that base revenues have increased for the 12 month period uh, with the exception of August and September. And then when you look at the kilowatt hour sales, uh, they're consistent, they're significantly lower uh, for August and September as well. Your kilowatt hour sales are about 4.1% lower um, for FY18 than they are from 17, FY17. And as a result of the lower sales, as we discussed, 2%. Um, decrease in the revenue. Any questions on that? Uh, just, just one question, if I may, and that's um, the, uh, if we were to look at it on a longer basis, and I know, I know you don't have the data uh, right. here, yes. uh, over a couple of years, uh, is that consistent with a, this sort of slow decrease in our overall I, I believe uh, we were flat up till now, and I just, um, it's just the July and September that's kind of 
you know, it, it could have been weather dependent. Sure. You know, it's, it's not one up positive, but. So it could be just a variation. It really could be, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions about that? Yeah, I guess maybe just it's more Colleen. So uh, obviously we'll track <coughs> meetings wise, but do you see anything that would impact the uh, the revenue growth in a, in a positive way? I mean, we've got a lot of things, initiatives going on, but it's hard to measure the results, I guess. But um, well, I, I guess really the question is, do we sort of see it flat to uh, being a percentage two down for the rest of the fiscal year, or do you see that as maybe increasing slightly or anything. I can let Jane speak to that I, I think that we're a little bit flatter a little bit lower because the weather was different last year yeah. weather is the biggest impact um, you know and, and plays a major role um, in that in this cold winter and that will increase our sales yeah. um, it's just weather impacts the sales and, and I think as what you showed you we build July and August in August and September, and that's when we had a decrease. So this past summer yeah. was significantly uh, milder yeah. than the previous summer. I mean, if we have a cold winter, that would impact it. So we monitor it on a right. regular basis, and, and you know we meet and discuss these things to, to yeah. make sure that we, we stay on target as, as, as well as we can. Although a relatively new uh, input is the is the cost efficiencies too, right? As Correct. We, as we could get more cost efficient, right. we could have an increase in revenue, but actually a decrease because the costs are. Right. Yeah. We're, Chairman, may I make an answer? Um, and, and as Hamid spoke earlier, uh, and he'll talk about it a little bit more when he does his presentation on the new substation in, in Wilmington, yeah. uh, there's several areas over there that are still in an economic development growth that we're hoping that um, you know that will yeah. happen. Uh, so we, we have some, you know, we're, tr we're trying to offset it with, you know, demand reduction yeah. techniques and, and economic growth incentives and, you know, so we have a lot of different ways that yeah. we're trying to stabilize the rate. Is, yeah, no, uh, I, I certainly not a, I, I think that that's really the point I guess I was driving at, you know, in a, in, in I can't speak so much on the utility side of business, but in a, in a regular business, that would be concerning over time to obviously see revenue, it's, although it's not a huge decline, but I think it's what you said, it, it's tracking the new initiatives and managing it, and the weather certainly is a variable, and you know, most business are as impacted as it would be in the energy business, but it's good. Okay. One quick question. Was a statement made about the weather being a big factor on the low, the, the peak demand, so like in winter and because summer I would imagine would have a lot of air conditioning loads that would really make a difference. And so I think if you're looking at uh, degree temperature days or something like that, do you look at it that way and yeah? Yep. Okay. It's the weather every day, you know, while summer and winter can be more extreme, mm -hmm. you can have milder shoulder months, uh, more extreme shoulder months. Weather is significant. Yeah. So, j okay. So we check our fidelity accounts. You check the Weather Channel, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another question? I, I want you to ask the question so that. No, 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 no. The right the, so the, qu the question was uh, is there a correlation between demand and, you know, historical temperature profiles? Yes. I can yes. forward you some slides that I've presented here on okay. any degree yeah. days yes. month, and that might be helpful to you. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Heating and cooling and, and cooling yeah. and yeah. Yeah. cooling cooling yeah. especially, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, did you want me to speak yes, to go the on to the next one. Okay, sure. So I was asked by the board um, to come up with somewhat of a cost analysis for uh, the possibility of changing financial reporting from fiscal year to calendar year. So as uh, it's a little difficult and challenging to come up with, a, with an avoided cost, I would call it. Um, but I gave, we gave it our best shot here. So a one-time six-month audit fee would be necessary uh, in order to change the year, and that's approximately a $36,000 cost. But then if you look at... Um, so what is our present audit fee? It is $36,000. 36, so it would yes. be, be the same? 
It would be because it would be a one time. They'd have to do another, another audit. audit. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, it's in an, it's in an off period of time. I mean, the the actually, it's a, it's it's a busier time for them. Actually, busier time for them. Yes, You've spoken it is. to them. Ah. Yes, unfortunately. Okay. Can I make a comment though? Yes. Yeah. So you'd have to do two, but then you don't have to do another one for a year. That's right. Right. You know what I mean? So we'll it's it's right. not really two in one year. You you do it a second right. time quicker, but then it's pushed off okay. longer. Let me yes. Let me let me give a little so background. Let me, let me give a little you. background here. Uh, right now, the department reports on a fiscal year, a June year end. The regulators. Whatever, they, whatever the department calls themselves these days, yeah. Department of Public Utilities. You. Deep, oh, I got the right term. Yeah, <laughs> this back one, this to week. that. Okay. They're actually reporting is on a calendar year. So we actually have two closings that go on during the year. And it's a concern about now, you know, are we, you know, the rate payers, you know, I don't think it was that big a deal at one point. But now, you know, my concern is the fact the ratepayers are now paying more, maybe they, sh maybe than they should be at this point, point. and so that's why I have brought this this topic forward, at this yeah. point. Mr. Chair, yes, go isn't ahead. there also? It seems to me a town meeting, or in thinking of town meeting, if, if from the planning of the town budget, isn't isn't it more useful for them to have us on a calendar year in terms of them planning? Or I I don't, don't know. I don't know that fact. I, that I don't know. I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Wendy, okay. now that I agree on your background. Sure. So um, what we tried to come up with collectively is, is the idea of what it actually takes us to get six months of one fiscal year and six months of another fiscal year <coughs> to get um, a DPU report that's accurate. So uh, we have a lot in the power supply side. They have to do more calculations, and net plant calculations have to be redone and recalculated. We have to take the balance sheet and combine that uh, six one year, six another year, as well as the profit and loss statement. There also is a um, inefficiency in the budget review because when we're reviewing, when we're trying to do the budget, uh, we, we try to use the DPU report. So the calendar year financials helps to mitigate these inaccuracies of submitting premature data of the rates, which currently right now is when um, Colleen and Jane and Hamid are talking about rates uh, and how they're going to go, and um, it's very difficult without the financials being complete. So, which depends on the public on the uh, power supply costs, which typically are not publicized until late March, as we know from our budget process. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we we came up with about approximately fifteen thousand dollars of avoided um, staff salary costs because the extra time it takes to just get these two sides of each year together. And these extra calculations, it takes a lot of time so and So you're uh, saying it's efforts. more efficient to be on a calendar year? Oh, it certainly is. Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Keep going, Wendy. So then, um, so then there are some things that you just can't measure, but they, but they do um, hold water. So we also have some inefficiencies <coughs> of having the town and RMLD finalize the fiscal year reports at the same time because this creates great challenges uh, for the town. It creates excessive demands on the town of Reading when we're trying to get reporting from them for our reporting. Yeah, that's you see what I'm was, saying? That was ours. Yes. Uh, this also will help alleviate the town concerns of accounts payable cutoffs and the double warrant reporting, which you're all familiar with. Can you explain that? Explain that. So at the end of uh, the fiscal year, what happens is um, we have to cut off our vendor payments at 630. We have to have a warrant, the payables warrant that you sign. One for the FY, so last year it was FY17, and then you have to have your vendors that you're paying for services or um, product, uh, services or, yes, products that you're buying in FY18, and you have to split that. So this goes on for about three or four weeks. So it causes extra work for the town, it causes extra work for us, and um, it actually causes extra work for the management review, for your review, you know, so that would, that they only have to do that, the town only has to do that because their books are closing at the same time as ours. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. So then of course we know the challenges of getting the actuarial reports on time, the OPEB and the pension reporting. Uh, this could change. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be waiting necessarily. We'd, we'd have it done and then close the year versus the other way around. Okay, mm -hmm. and then uh, vendor cooperation, as, as little as um, 
you may think this, or, or anybody for that matter, may think this means vendor cooperation becomes uh, a large part of the inefficiencies, especially with those payable cutoffs. Because uh, a lot of vendors either close their doors for a month or they go on vacation and they become a little lax because of vacations. They don't, they're not quick to finalize and get us all of our invoices. We're trying to ha you know, get an audit together for August and we're not getting invoices f for the previous year until the beginning of August. And it becomes very difficult to manage this. It takes a lot more time and energy, of course. Um, and then the same thing with uh, staff. Of course, summer is a high, high vacation time. And it takes every department at the RMLD to uh, get an audit accomplished. So when you have a lack of uh, department staff, simply because everybody likes the summer and wants to go on vacation, that becomes challenging as well. Not that it's, you know, it's just another factor. Mm -hmm. So is your, if I may, is your recommendation to move to a calendar year? I would certainly recommend that we move to a calendar year. And what limits us to move to a calendar year? Uh, well, right now I think we're in the information stage. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be in the information stage at this point. <laughs> I well, think the new s matter is I the think window at which time if we don't do it, we get to wait another mm -hmm. year to decide. Right, right. yes. Okay. You have something to add, Colleen? Yeah. When I worked in Danvers, we were a fiscal year and we changed to a calendar year and it was it was night and day it really when you're trying to do I was telling Wendy this morning when I'm trying to review the budget and I'm used to looking you know because that was a big benefit in Danvers when we changed the calendar year now I'm looking at the DPU report and it's the right numbers it's not half of one <coughs> year and half of another year and then I'm trying to mm -hmm. you know fit it into I mean, so there's a lot of uh, extra work that goes into uh, splitting it and then trying to put it back together so that you can figure it out. Um, and, in, you know, we switched it over in, in Danvers, and there wasn't a big uh, political problem with it. Um, I think one of the things Wendy was mentioning is, you know, we're, we're trying to calculate the rates for next year now because the town wants them now so it can segue into their budget, but we're so preliminary that it makes me a nervous wreck until we actually get our, our numbers next year. Yep. And hopefully, you know, our preliminary draft, draft, draft is on the money, which is, you know, Plus is a little difficult, especially with the volatility of power supply. And, but we know the town wants to get the numbers in their budget, but if we had our numbers all set, and they weren't work, waiting for a segue at the same time we're doing, we're doing our budgets at the same time. So it just becomes a little bit, um, you know, I don't know, maybe I don't feel as comfortable with the numbers that we're giving out. Yeah. So to answer to maybe backtrack on your question, John, sure. it'd be up to the board to make that, this decision and to vote this as to go to a fiscal year. I think we need to have all five of us here to do that, okay. quite frankly. So, so, yeah. so would we, uh, in from a timing perspective, if we're here in the January time frame, would that be appropriate I think uh, topic so. of discussion? I think so, yes. I'd, I'd like to ask that to be put on to yes. the uh, agenda. Okay. Yeah, well, just to, to piggyback on that, uh, would you, I, I would think if you're going to have a calendar fiscal year, if you wait until January, I mean, there's things you need to do or, or sensitize your vendor. I mean, if you wait till January, isn't that too late to? We would do it the following year. We do it the following year. Yeah, we'd have another budget process right. starting in September. Oh, that's what I was. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. What if the mm -hmm. intent was, if there was a sense of urgency to do it, we'd have to make a no, decision. No, we'd have to make a decision now. Yes, it started in 2019. Was that, what was your expectation? I honestly didn't have one because I wasn't sure uh, which way the board wanted to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so the thing, thing that was too was Wendy and her her people were busy with the audit. Too. Yes, and this is why this was this was not yeah. presented. No, I mean, earlier. I think it right. makes a lot of right. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the we rationals. held off until the audit was complete. Right. Well, and the audit was prolonged, unfortunately, so right. we didn't have a choice. Yeah. Okay. In the matter. Very good. Go ahead. Yeah. I just had one question. What is the budget year for the town of Reading? Is that the town of Reading is from uh, through June? Same through June. June so, so that's like same. Imagine the school North school year every, budgets, you know, right? Town yeah. has the same year. Yeah. Year. All so, the towns have yeah. June year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that will be a fact that, yeah. Yeah, yeah but let me, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but if, if uh, is there, because I want to be respectful, Phil, you've got more knowledge of this than I do, but if it's a good thing to do, 
I mean, it's, it's either now or a year from now. So the question is, if there's value to do it and there's no obstacles, then really it's just getting the board together to make a decision. Right. So I'm just wondering, do we want, is that a... Well, there's, there's some other background here that, okay. that you... I'm probably, other than Jane, lived through the ills, what we call the ills. This was uh, recommended as, as one of the correction of the ills, the period called the ills. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, how sensitive the town is to this, and I think that's why I would. Oh, do that. well, that's uh, yeah. I was qualified the sensitivity, my remark right. for knowing that. Yeah. Wasn't that right. 200 years ago? That's yes, yeah. that is actually <laughs> we need to 2000. I think it's 2001. Time. <laughs> I, I so that's why I brought uh, it up now again. Maybe we have a new level of confidence. Uh, yes. <laughs> I will I tell you. Soon. I would like to tell you that the uh, the auditors are on board. They're ready when we are. So you know, and I know. actually had Put talked to writing? the. Is it possible to get that in writing from them? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If I actually had talked to the town manager when I first got hired. Yeah. And said, um, I'd like to change it to calendar year. That was four years ago, and I, he said he didn't have a problem then. So. Um, okay. Uh, I don't see. I wasn't here for the ills, but I don't. I'm not really sure why that recommendation was made. It's not like the town would have any less or more control. It would be the same. It actually would just be more efficient okay. for us and more efficient for them. Uh, they would get better numbers for their input. So that may have been something that was implemented, but I, I haven't quite grasped how that was going to correct something. I, I think there was, could have been other measures that I think have already been put in place to prevent the, those types of uh, yeah. um, actions okay. in the past. And okay. Just to ease your concern, Tom, if, if it was uh, decided in January, the accounting department could pull it off. <laughs> yeah, well, There's a can-do <laughs> attitude. <laughs> well, what I was getting at, though, I mean, I'm, and I, I'm just going from my own experience with the budget process, if you had made a decision in January, I, I'm sure there's vendors and people that, because you run into the same problem, no one's going to... Well, no, actually, um, in December is when most companies, and I only know this from past experience in my other life, yeah. most companies are actually cleaning up their books. They're trying to get all their inventories in order <clears throat> for year-end tax results. Yeah. yeah. So they want everything oh, no, cleaned that, but up. Our, but if people we do business with, they're used to <coughs> us having a closing in June, so they, they don't worry about getting something in December versus January. They may, though, for their own books. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah no, I mean, I was, uh, yeah. I'm fully supportive mm -hmm. of it, so it's, if it's okay. whatever we decide. I would so, say, whatever we do, if it's next year, we ought to plan like you said, Phil, to have it on the agenda for January. Right, uh, right. So we'll put it on the agenda for January. <laughs> be Tracy's already got that. Done. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Very good. So, Hamid, you're up. <laughs> Hamid, you were already up. <laughs> huh? Come on, he's up again. <laughs> All right. Encore. <laughs> All right. Well. I'll be glad to give you the report for the month of October, the spendings, uh, expenditures basically, on the capital authorization projects. On the first slide, you see the list of all the specific capital improvement projects that board uh, approved and we budgeted. So on the left, you see the description. On the second column from the left, you see the percentage completion. For the month of October is the next column. You see all the uh, exp ex expenditures for that month the year-to-date actual, and then the budgeted, and then the remaining balance for each one of those projects. So in a nutshell, we're making good progress, steady progress on those projects. Uh, most of the heavy construction projects are coming in the spring, so you're going to see heavy expenditures on those. The next one is the routine construction, capital co constructions. Basically, uh, those pro those <laughs> projects, capital improvement projects, that they're not so specific, and we cannot really predict. They go in this bucket. Uh, to give you an example, for instance, oil spill. We don't know how many oil spills we're going to have and when they're going to, you know. Uh, need. So we, I mean, anytime you take the transformer down, it's a uh, expense, and when it goes back up, uh, that's a capital. Uh, the, another one is the storms. Uh, the other category is like underground subdivisions. They knew. We don't know how many they're going to go uh, in each year or how many we need to repair. <coughs> uh, so 
all of those that you know when we build something they are capital that charge to the this project and it go, goes in this bucket so to cut the long story short in month of october we spend hundred thirty one thousand eight hundred twelve dollars that brings the year to date for four hundred eleven thousand two hundred sixty three this is the f- for a fiscal year fy 18. so i'm expecting that number to go up to one million which usually we put one million dollars in this bucket for this type of activities the next slide, you see the facilities, IRD, Integrated Resource Department, Jane's Group, and IT. Uh, Wendy's Group, the capital projects, basically there's not, uh, there's not much going on those, uh, uh, but you see the expenditures for each specific uh, department or division. Uh, in the chart below, you see, uh, you see the, the ca- all divisions, basically, year to date. The, for the month of October, we spent total together $322,741. The year to date for fiscal year is $1,651,984. Uh, uh, we budgeted <coughs> $7,685,521, and the remaining balance is uh, $6 million. I checked with uh, Wendy the last time, uh, we're closing the date, I guess, in uh, November. Uh, we are up close to $2 million, this number. So. And it's going to go up in month of December, probably two and a half to 2.6 million. So we're making steady progress on those. The next category is the routine maintenance. These are the number of maintenance programs that we uh, started back in 2015 when we identified the problems area and when we went from reactive to become more proactive. So uh, under these categories, you see that you know we're making steady progress again for the pole replacements, pole inspections. We do 10% uh, of the uh, uh, RMLD owned uh, uh, pole inspections uh, a year, which amounts to 640 to 700 poles uh, per year that we test. And I'm glad to announce that, you know, well, the first time that we tested, we had like about 37% the first year. And now the last report that I got was down to 5%. Mm. Wow. So Impressive. we're making uh, progress. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we didn't have any condemned, so we had some failures uh, that we take care of those based on the priority and where they are and how mm-hmm. on the list of the priorities. The quarter inspection of the feeders, these are the feeders that uh, the crews, they ride around and check for trouble, signs of troubles to uh, address them before anything happens. The manhole inspection program, we're making progress on those, porcelain cutout replacements. The tree trimming, uh, it's really going well. I did a little research, more dug into after the last time that Mr. Kelly was concerned about, you know, the percentages that we had for 2017 year to date. We had 29% because that's how the numbers, they came out through, you know, through the number of troubles and the areas that we had. Uh, Compared to the five years average, you're going to see that, you know, in the last uh, slide that it's shrinking. The tree trimming is working. We are not completely done with the three-year cyclic program that we started because we started that program in 2015, and that uh, three-year cycling is going to end in 2018 um, uh, for five years, and now we're up to five years. Because, you know, it's mm, because of the budget reasons. So sure. we started with three years, then we went to five years. So uh, the tree trimming is going well. The substation maintenance, we do the infrared uh, every month at the substations as well as the industrial parks looking for signs of troubles. And I'm glad to announce that so far we haven't had any. Actually, we the last time we had it, it was back in, uh, I guess, June for uh, just one mm, capacitor bank in analog that we fixed the bushings and that was it basically as soon as you stop looking you'll have it again yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing routinely we, we, we monitor True. that i'm going to add another category uh, just uh, uh, for the sake of the interest of what the, this program and benefits of this program and that's for substations uh, i mean subdivisions upgrades Lately, we've had lots of those old substations that we see the transformers, you know, because they're outdated and the underground cables are old. So I had the staff to prioritize those and go with the list of, you know, we got like about 20, 30 subdivisions. And based on the age, we're going to address those and put that in capital authorization projects so we can address so many a year and upgrade them 
So they're not uh, failing. And, and these are the underground? These are underground subdivisions. Which is mostly Linfield, I assume. Linfield, right. And some in North Reading, uh, few in Reading, and uh, some in uh, Wilmington. Mm -hmm. uh, the last the substation that we started, uh, you know, actually we caught up by surprise, was Shasta Drive in uh, Wilmington. And uh, that, was the, that was the problematic because we had the transformer that, you know, tree grew right underneath the pad, lifted the pad, and, you know, it caused some damage. Right. And then the cables, uh, cable <coughs> failed, so we had to uh, rip the section and, you know, fix it. Mm -hmm. So, and this is the problem. But the problem is once you open up the can of worm, now you're going to have to let them all out, right? <laughs> 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 so this is another problem. You fix one uh, transformer that you get into, you think it's trouble, then the next one right next to it, you know, you see, oh, I can't leave this. I'm going to have to fix that one too. And one thing leads to another. So you're going to see the report on that coming <coughs> in the future months for the subdivisions upgrade. The next slide shows the double poles, uh, basically the ownership. Uh, uh, we have 50-50%, 50% RMLD, 50% Verizon. The custodial in the North Reading and uh, also the, uh, uh, in the North Reading, it's RMLD uh, and also Reading. Uh, the Linfield and Wilmington, it's Verizon. So, and you see the split uh, in, uh, in the territories, basically. These are the custodials that uh, we're talking about. So, the next, po the next slide shows the engines. Engines is a program that it's uh, shared between the utilities. Basically, who's the next one to go and fix this stuff or transfer the uh, assets. In the Linfield, RMLD has three, five, five transfers to do. In Town of Reading, we <coughs> have uh, 29 transfers and 70 pole butts that they need to be re removed. In North Reading, we have 13 transfers and 31 pole butt. Uh, in Wilmington, we've got 31 transfers and uh, pulling the poles, we got four. Uh, we make, made a good progress uh, within the past few weeks uh, in pulling the pole butts out of the ground and you know completing those about we did about uh, 15 of them and by end of the next week we're going to do one of their between five to ten so we pretty much we keeping up with them this is actually as i see these devil poles i i see them as a good sign meaning we're making progress in <laughs> upgrading the system and then, you know, I know I, mm, they, they, they do look ugly. We don't like them either, but, you know, it takes time really for transfers. We usually, you know, we do the transfer in a timely manner. But when it comes to Verizon and Comcast, you know, we don't have any control over those. So we have to wait until they uh, complete the transfers before we pull the uh, butt out of the ground, the pull butt. Uh, the next slide shows basically our reliability, uh, uh, health status, uh, the SADI, KD, and SAFI. You see all of those numbers are well below the uh, regional and national averages. The uh, bar, the blue bar, is the national, and the uh, brown bar is basically the regional averages. And we're doing very well uh, across those categories. So it uh, shows that you know we're making progress. Especially that SADI, you see that the SADI and SAFI, these two, they usually go together. And because, you know, the, the trend is going downward, that means that our maintenance program is working, right. which right. is good. Uh, the last slide basically shows you on the right the annual average, the five years average. You see the equipment, we had like in average, we had 65 equipment failure. The trees, we had 55. The wildlife, we had 42. And the other categories, you see the numbers are pretty much very minimum. Uh, on the left, you see the year to date at the end of October. This includes the storm numbers also. You see the equipment are shrinking. Uh, basically, we got 28. Uh, the trees, we had 35. Even though the storm was severe on the uh, on uh, October 29th, mm -hmm. Sunday, October 29th, mm -hmm. we had number three at all. Most of them they were actually tree related, uh, but uh, we, uh, we we are not doing too bad on, on that category. The wildlife are 33 because we increased our light lifeguards, uh, so saving animals from getting electrocuted and 
saving our assets from getting damaged. So it works for both. They're both happy. Glad you put in the size of the circle. It does show it's all yeah. shrinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all yeah. shrinking, yeah. Especially that was my concern because after Mr. Kelly mentioned about, you know, how come the percentages they come in about, but right. we changed those percentages to actually absolute numbers. absolute numbers. And, you know, that shows now better comparison. Uh, yep. Just worked out the last time the way that, you know, well, in f those categories, the three came out 20%, 29%, same as the five years average 29%, which seems like, you know, we're not making progress, but in reality, we're making good progress. You, any comments from the GM? Okay. I don't like the circle chart. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like it. I think we should do it a different way. Okay. <laughs> we can talk offline. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay. Any questions from the board? <laughs> All right. No. No, buddy. Okay. Very good. You're doing the uh, the uh, yeah the bit procurements too. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So let's start with the first <coughs> one. You want to give us a setup, and then we'll get the motion. <coughs> sure. The first one is uh, the let me take, take a look, just make sure I have the janitorial. One. Yeah. The janitorial services. Uh, this is the chapter 30 B bit. Uh, the bid went to 44 uh, companies, and three were uh, responsible, responsive bidder, and basically they provided the, uh, all the documents that we requested. The lowest responsible, responsive bidder was with the Transcend Maintenance Services <coughs> for $67,325.40. Uh, that's a three years contract. <coughs> Uh, the reason that it came out of it, the reason we're going out again, because, uh, you know, we weren't so happy, we pleased with the uh, previous uh, janitorial services that, you know, was provi provided by the previous company. They weren't doing a good job, so we had to terminate the contract, and then we were out to bet for this new contract. This one is by much better, you know, and also they have uh, good recommendations from the people that they used to work for and uh, provided services for. So... We also took a uh, couple of areas out of them to save some money. That's like harvest building and also the operation, the garage area. That's going to be done, cleaned uh, by in our maintenance department. Mm -hmm. So, right, that's Can I add a comment? Sure, go ahead. Because when you're paying to clean square footage, but all you're doing in that square footage is sweeping, it, right. you're not getting your value. So we yeah, just took right. them out. Okay. Makes so they're just sense. large, flat, square footage areas that were being swept. Good. Yeah. Very good. Do you want to do this? You so read the motion, please? Yes. Uh, move that bid IFB 2018-13 for janitorial services be awarded to Transcend Maintenance Services, Inc. for $67,325.40 pursuant to MGL Chapter 30B as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. This is a three-year contract. That second it. Second motion. And Moon seconded. You have Dave officially going off at a, at a particular time now, so I don't really, we need to do roll call votes okay. at this point. So it's just, you know, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. I propose that motion carries. Let the record show it was 3-0. Okay. Move on Thank to you. the next one. Yep. The next one is IFP 2018-17. That's uh, the Cooper Power Systems or Compatible Meters and Equipment for AMI Mesh Network. You know, we bought this system not too long ago for Club 500 to fix the problems that we had reading these meters. They're working great. It's a great product. So uh, we sent a bid out to 15 companies, and we got the received the proposals from two, Eaton and Wesco. And the lowest responsible responsive bidder was eaten for uh, $83,199.36. Uh, the West Coast basically was not responsive because they didn't provide codes for most of the categories that we asked for. Mm -hmm. So this one is being awarded to Eaton. Eaton Cooper is the same company they joined. Okay. So. Go ahead. Move that proposal IFP 2018 17 for Cooper Power System or compatible meters and equipment for the AMI mesh network expansion and migration be awarded to Eaton for $83,199.36 
pursuant to MGL Chapter 164, Section 56D, on the recommendation of the General Manager. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? I see none. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Let the record show that carried 3-0. Thank Keep you, going. sir. Next one, please. The next one is IFB. Uh, it's 2018-19 uh, line truck chassis and trailer inspection, preventive maintenance, and the repair services. <coughs> That's for inspection of the trucks, as it may mentions, and the preventive maintenance on those. We send a bid for to seven companies. The sealed bid was were received from uh, the companies Taylor and Lloyd. There's only one bid that was uh, actually received, sealed bid, and that was for the amount of $151,462.31. That's a three-year contract again. You know, okay. They're a very re reputable firm, and you know, they dip in, they're doing a great job. Okay. Yep. Move that bid IFB 2018-19, line truck chassis and trailer inspection, preventative maintenance and repair service be awarded to Taylor and Lloyd, Inc. for $151,462.31, pursuant to MGL Chapter 30B, as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. This is a three-year contract. Is that a quick question? Phil? Second the motion, please. Second the motion. First. Okay, yes. now ask the question. Phil, mm -hmm. uh, Phil, yeah. <laughs> I'm heat. Yes. Uh, did you say there was no other bidder? Yeah, yeah there was no, there, nobody else, uh, you know, this was the only one who responded. Uh, that's the only one that I have. We sent to seven. Uh -huh. Some of them due to the timing and, you know, they don't have time ready to, and we are too small for them. Yeah. Some of them, you know, they, they're just the time of the year that they don't, Okay. Want to participate? Unfortunately, we don't have any control over that. But it's, it was advertised. We sent okay. them. We get, gave them ample time to respond, and there was only the one that responded. Okay. The next one is the same too. That's yeah. I had truck. the same question. Yeah, yeah. maybe too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Further discussion? No. I see none. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Again, let that motion. The motion carried. Let the record show three zero. Okay. On the next one, B thank you, sir. Me? The last one is IFP 2018 20 line truck lift equipment inspection, preventive maintenance, and repair services. Uh, the bid was sent to four companies, and basically, we received uh, the, the response from only one, James Kiley. The same situation, only one uh, responded. It's a three year contract for the total amount of uh, $111,495. Okay. Interesting. Should I make a motion? Make a motion? Yeah. The motion. Move that bid IFB 2018 20 line truck lift equipment inspection, preventive maintenance, and repair service be awarded to James A. Kylie Company for $111,495 pursuant to MGL Chapter 30B as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. This is a three year contract. Second it. Second motion. Yeah. Same question. We only got one bid on this. One bid. That's only one. Yeah, this one the same situation. Okay. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Okay. Bless you. Further discussion? I see none. All, the all in favor, please raise your right hand. Oppose that motion carries. Let the record show 3 0. Okay. Very Thank you good. so much. I right. appreciate it. Any questions? Any? Okay. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you. So now we're just down to general discussion. You have the email and the rate comparisons are in the, the package tonight. Um, in terms of the future meetings, you've got the awards, the art awards in there. Our next board meeting is January the 25th. Uh, the CAB meeting is January the 17th. Okay, so we'll need a, uh, we'll have a, a probably a round robin, I think, to probably set that. Um, yeah, and then I think if we can get the next couple of weeks, if we can get the yeah. annual schedule, then we'll right. check. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Now I did put on here the uh, return in the town to the town of Reading subcommittee. Um, we need we probably should go back now and schedule another meeting among all the the, the subcommittee members. Um, so I asked Tracy to kind of sit around and find everybody's available dates. Everybody, at this point. I did talk to Dan Enzinger in church on this Sunday, and I just told him that that's, this is all we're trying to do okay. at this point. So just to get dates together and so we can all meet. It'd probably be sometime in January. I doubt we can have it this month. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think so. 
The 25th of December would be good, but, you know, I don't, I don't think that would work. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so we need to uh, schedule that meeting again. Okay. All right. Do we have anything else for regular session? Okay. Yep. You want to add anything? No, this is good. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Welcome. Well, good, to have, hey, good to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. Want to make a motion? Yes. Uh, move to adjourn uh, the regular session. Uh, no, how about move oh. the, with the board going to executive session? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right, of course. <laughs> move to the, the board move, move into uh, executive session. Uh, read the rest of the motion. motion. Read the rest of the motion, please. Mm. So we're legal. Mm. Where is it here? Move that the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second okay. motion. All right. Let's add after purchase of real property and discussion thereon. Okay. Do I have to leave? What? Yeah, I have to leave now, right? Okay, yes, you can leave now. No, your but, permission. But, but, no, from, from the executive okay. session. Yeah. Uh, yes, all right. those in favor of going into executive session, Mr. Sempek? Aye. Mr. Mr. Sempek. Aye. Mr. Mr. O'Rourke, aye. We will adjourn to the other room. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Tracy, should we bring our iPads with us? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs>